But we're also talking about uh, the great memories of the past tonight. Brian Wheeler, Michael Holton now joined on this special edition of Trailblazers Courtside by one of the prominent members of that Trailblazers championship team, Larry Steele. Larry, does it feel like it was 40 years ago? I don't know which sounds better, four decades or 40 years. <laughs> no, it feels like about 20. There you go. There you go. Now, you were, of course, uh, a rookie on the very first Trailblazer team, 18 wins back in 1970, and to see the progress all the way to that team in 77, I mean, did, did you sense that before even that season started that there was the potential to have a year as special as that? Uh, no, did not at all. I, I believe what happens in most basketball players, you start the year and you always have those goals of being world champions, but the realistic part of it is you, you play the game. You play throughout uh, the preseason, the regular season, and we just kept getting better. I think at the end of the season, we started feeling like we were uh, coming together at the right time, for sure. But when you went into the championship series, was there a confidence that you could win it, or was there more of a feeling of we're happy to be here? Oh, there's confidence you could win it, for sure. We uh, had the... Uh, had enough uh, games, playoff games, under our belt at that time that we were playing at a level that we knew we could uh, beat anybody. And, and you don't really think about that too much. You know as a player, you get out there and you play, you enjoy the game. And so we just were confident and played each game and kept playing and ended up winning it. You know, Larry, a lot of players play basketball and never win a championship, never play for a championship. And you hear championship caliber teams referenced in terms of you have this lifelong bond. Can you speak to that? Is that true or is that just something said by those that never won one? Well, I don't think there's any question that you see it almost every year that uh, players end up trying to find their friends that are great players and they get together and it's all to uh, win a ring. And I don't know the details, but every once in a while you hear about a player taking a salary cut, trying to get to the right team to uh, have a chance to be on the championship team again. Uh, but for us at that time, uh, we were drafted by whom we were drafted, and we ended up having uh, some, a great, really a great team, a great team of individuals that uh, really played well together as a group, and it's one of those special situations that you don't see very often these days. You know, Larry, you have a unique uh, perspective on the championship that you were the longest tenured member on the team when you won the championship, and then you were on the team, I think, two or three seasons following the championship. Did winning a championship, how did it change the locker room? Did it raise expectations in the subsequent seasons? Well, I don't want to belittle the championship year because it was <laughs> phenomenal. Uh, but the truth, any player on the team, I believe, and I'll speak for myself, is that 77-78 team was the greatest team that I ever played on when we won 50 out of our first 60 games, which is highly unusual. You can look at the record every year of all the great teams, and very few teams win 50 out of the first 60. It was the most consistent basketball team, but the makings of that 77-78 team were obviously the 77 championship team, so we got better. Unfortunately, we had a few injuries, and it all, all went away. <laughs> what was extremely rare, of course, was that uh, of the first Trailblazers team to make the playoffs in its franchise history ends up going all the way to win a championship. We see so often, especially in the NBA, that teams seem to have to get over hurdles. Maybe it's a specific team or it's a specific round of the playoffs that uh, they have to get through maybe one particular season before they can uh, get a little further and possibly win the championship uh, in the seasons to come. So for you guys to do it on the first try was pretty remarkable. Once you accomplished it, uh, did you start thinking, hey, we'll probably win a few more championships. You know, we're, we're still young. We've got a great group. We're going to be together for a while. And maybe it puts it into perspective because we're talking 40 years later about the one championship championship that the, this franchise has been able to get to this point, how difficult it is really to win a world title. Well, it's, it's very, very difficult, and uh, 40 years would be uh, a good testament to that that thought. Uh, but you see so many, uh, I used to say, I used to say, except for the last three years, I used to say you have to be really good uh, to get to the playoffs, to have a chance to win, and then you got to be lucky. you got to have a few breaks once in a while. When we won the championship, uh, the Lakers I had a few injury problems with their own, and we were able to beat the Lakers and then go on and be world champions. I used to say that because now you got Cleveland and Golden State, and you just, they're just good, period, and they just show up every year. So uh, so you have to be good, but you have to have some breaks along the way, and we had some breaks. And, and quite honestly, you look at the teams uh, with the Trailblazers, with uh, all the great players we know. I won't go through the list of the early 90s, 90, 91, 92 with a few breaks well I, actually the truth is if it wasn't for michael jordan there may be two more championship <laughs> banners up there in the in the rose garden 
You know, Blazer Mania, we used that term uh, in, in, earlier in the program, and it's uh, something that people that have followed the Blazers over the years know full well about it. But it was kind of, it really, uh, if it if wasn't born officially in that season, it really uh, kind of grew to be a big-time phenomenon. Can you speak to uh, the fandom, the way that uh, the entire region in the Northwest kind of embraced this basketball team? It was it was something that seemed to bring everybody together. Oh, no, no question about it. Uh, there are so many people that I run into that still can say exactly what they were doing on this day, on June 5th, 1977. There are so many commence commencements and people were in different uh, events and they know that the speakers may be informing the audience what was going on at that point in time. But what happened uh, as far as the fans were concerned and how all of the players were treated from that team, uh, they remember all of us. and. Uh, it was a, uh, the start of something very special, to have uh, uh, your first chance at winning a championship actually manifest was, is, as you mentioned, very unusual. So the fans have remembered, and uh, I think it's uh, still evident today. So often uh, we talk about in a best of seven series, a turning point. And a lot of people seem to point to the end of game two. The Sixers are about to win their second straight game on their home floor. You guys are coming home for two, and then the fight takes place. Uh, it's uh, it's Daryl Dawkins, it's uh, it's Mo, and uh, basically, you know, Luke ends up uh, winning in a big-time fashion, and everybody said that turned the series around. Did you guys have a sense at that time that it, it could be that kind of uh, effect on maybe what, what was going to happen the rest of the series? Well, I'd ask Michael about that, too, but uh, no, we really didn't make any difference. <laughs> and it's one of those things that happened, and uh, I don't know how every player felt on the team, but... Uh, I don't remember us really talking about that much. We had a job to do. We come back to Portland win or two, but it was great entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> you know, obviously I don't want to applaud violence and the league is certainly fight free today for a lot of reasons, but I remember as a kid seeing that and, and thinking the world of Maurice Lucas because he came in and really defended the franchise, so to speak, and, and stood up. And a lot of guys act tough, but Maurice Lucas was tough. That's true. And some people say if it wasn't that moment, it was maybe right before the start of game three when he walks over to the Sixers huddle and shakes hands with Daryl Dawkins that that kind of disarmed uh, Dawkins and, and maybe the entire Sixers team for the rest of the series. Well, Maurice was not only a great player, he's a really smart guy. And he knew how to get in the heads of other people. It wasn't with his <laughs> elbow and forearm, it was with his head. And so he knew what he was doing. And uh, from that standpoint, it would have made a difference for Maurice. I think the whole team had to get out and do what they're doing. But just taking one player that took it as a challenge and uh, his enthusiasm and leadership, uh, no, no, no question at all. The one thing about that game in Philadelphia, I will admit, that when we got off of the bench, a lot of us got off the bench, came out on the court. I remember one of the fans was, had came out on the court at the end, at the end line. And he was, looked like he was going to come out. And I said, get him out of here. And some security guard grabbed him and pulled him out. And I just felt like I had a lot of power. So I was at the other <laughs> I don't think I was in that video, though. I don't think they're showing what I was doing. I was keeping peace down by the bench. That's it. That can't be underestimated, that, that fact of the, uh, of, the, of the situation, too. A, um, that was, of course, the first season also for, for Jack Ramsey as your head coach. Can you speak to what, uh, what he brought and how he was able to – his system was seemingly perfect for uh, what you guys were like as basketball players? Uh, really good point. I'm glad you brought that up because not only was Jack a great basketball mind, he was just a great person. Uh, he had uh, the care and, the, uh, and the, the dedication to the game. And what he brought was really the offense. He brought an offense that just fit our team perfectly and Bill and we had a good passing team in general. And we had a motion offense. Bill could get the ball out and uh, it just all fit together very well. And we were deep. We had uh, sort of uh, everybody that came off the bench played the same way as the person they were subbing in for. So it worked well. Let me ask you a question about, about the offense, the motion offense. What were the two or three themes, the things you guys tried to accomplish every night offensively? Every night it was a uh, break. So you're always looking for the break uh, off the rebound. We didn't break out of the basket much. Uh, but we'd break off the rebound and then the forwards would cross underneath the basket. So we'd hit the wings, we'd cross underneath, come out to the wings, and then uh, the ball would usually go into the, uh, the wing position. And then we'd hit Bell, sort of a split off of him and split on the other side and he looked for the cutters or we looked for a mistake by the defense. And that was our offense. And it worked really well. I, I, I got to jump in there, Wills, because I understand that, and I played a lot of basketball where you had to cross, and that was mm -hmm. that was your early offense, if mm -hmm. you will. Turnout is what it yes. was later called. Turnout. Mm -hmm. 
I'm trying to say this without taking a shot at today's style of basketball, but when you see guys now run for the three-point line versus run for layups or cross out, it's yeah. so different stylistically than when you played. What's your response? Oh, good question. Uh, it's not the same game. <clears throat> it's a completely different game. I don't think it's as uh, poetic, maybe, from a team standpoint. You have so much isolation now and some great players, and it's fun to watch. But when we played, and especially that team, it was really movement, a lot of movement. And we were always uh, getting out on the break. And I think the big difference is now with the one-on-one -on -one or two-on-two -two or the isolation, you always have a few guys sort of sitting out there waiting. So they're always in defensive position. Whereas in the motion offense, you have, have the defense moving and you have a better opportunity of getting out on the break. And I think that's technically the, the biggest, biggest change. But it was great basketball and fun to watch and uh, a little bit higher scoring games and a few more fast breaks. And, I don't know whether there's many dunks or not, or for sure not as many three-pointers at that time. It, but the ball moved. I remember as a kid when I watched the Portland Trailblazers, the ball never stuck in one place. And when we watch Golden State today, I think they're as close as any team in today's game that plays with constant movement. Yes, and I think the big thing about watching the game last night that you see the commentators talking about, that was a great pass. It's almost like the unusual play when they have the great pass. And I think when we played, it was sort of commonplace. We were making the pass, and the reason we made the passes, uh, and they looked easy at times, was because the players that were cutting would cut because they knew they'd get the ball. You don't cut hard every time if you don't get the ball, as you well know. So you're going to get the ball, you make a concerted effort to get in position to get it. Larry, I want to take this opportunity also to applaud you because having played a couple seasons here, I. I want to just go out on a limb and speak for all the players that played here that didn't win a championship. We all admire and look up to you guys for not only what you did, but for your availability to continuously uh, allow us to celebrate you. Well, thank you very much, Michael. And uh, I'm glad you brought up all the players. There's been hundreds of players play for this franchise. And uh, sometimes you don't get credit unless you win the big one. And so we appreciate it. And then we really did win it for all the guys that maybe only played a half a season here. And it's because it's about the game of basketball and how you love that game. So thank you. Question that I wanted to ask both you and, and Bob. Uh, you know, a lot of us have gotten to know him in his more recent years, but uh, you got to know Bill Walton in his uh, young days as, as a player. Uh, he, he was uh, certainly a unique personality even back then, maybe even more so. Uh, what's your best Bill Walton story? I take the fifth. <laughs> <laughs> There's that many, huh? I got, I've got one. Uh, I, I locked her right next to Bill for five years. Okay. And so he was here, and I was sitting where I am, and uh, one particular year, he was on a, uh, a breatharian diet. <laughs> and uh, we won't go into that, but a lot of bread, but he was eating a lot of carrots. And, uh, and I'll, let's see, how do I say this? At the end of the game, his home white uniforms, I'm not kidding you, had a tent of carrot. And let's just say recycled carrot juice doesn't smell that good either. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for keeping that PG for us. It's a lot of diets. I hadn't heard of a breatharian one. I, I guess I don't know why. Uh, that, that probably has, probably has uh, served its purpose by, by this point in time. Uh, Larry, now, before we let you go, uh, for those who uh, remember the uh, celebration of the of the championship in, in the uh, weeks and months to come, you may have uh, been able to have uh, an album such as this, Equitable Savings. I don't even, I don't think they exist anymore, but they put out this uh, celebration of the Blazers uh, championship season, the official Trailblazers record album. Now, I noticed that we have uh, Bob's signature, uh, Sean's is on here, uh, Bill uh, is on here, and uh, uh, Dr. Jack, but we do not have Larry Steele, so that we have to, we have to remedy that situation situation because the value of this album will go up immensely nickel. as soon well, at least a nickel and, and I think probably a lot of nickels uh, with with your contribution to it so so there we go now that's one more important signature from that championship team that we have on that particular album so uh, thank you very much for stopping by and uh, congratulations on on uh, a great memory that uh, I don't think anybody in Portland will ever forget and it's one of those things that I know as time goes on there's a lot more people that say they were there that day at the Coliseum than the uh, than the almost 13,000 that were but uh, but there were a lot of people that watched it and a lot of people that celebrated it and I'm glad we can still celebrate it today thank you for helping us do that thank you Brian thank you Michael yep. Larry Steele joining us here on Trailblazers Courtside again this very special edition of uh, the program as we celebrate the 40th anniversary of the Blazers taking home that uh, world championship trophy